Meet Val a new language. Because, you know, honestly, what we need right now in 2023 is another new language. Because right now, I'm not going to lie to you, when I'm programming V, OCaml, Nim, uh, Odin, Zig, Rust, Carbon, I sit there and I think, you know what I need? I need a new language. Because all these other languages, okay, they ain't it. I need something different. I need something new, something fresh. Meet Val, a new language alternative to C++ and Rust. Val is a high-level programming language that runs close to the metal, said the language creator, Demi Rakordan. Val is a new high-level programming language that runs cr close to the metal. It's the brainchild of Demi Rakordan, a postdoc researcher at Northeastern University who focuses on language design and type-based approaches for memory safety. It started as a byproduct of research uh, she did with Google and Adobe on the Swift programming language and the, and the discipline of mutable value semantics, which upholds the independence of values to support local reasoning. I'm sorry or congratulations. I ain't going to read that. Um, Haskell, Rust, and R are other examples of languages that use mutable value semantics. Oh, man, giving pick boners right here. Uh, this is a project that started around two years ago. I wrote the paper. I collaborated with great people at Google and Adobe. Rakardan uh, told the new stack. And after this paper, I had a small idea in the back of my head, and I thought, oh, we'll try implementing some stuff, and it will be a two- or three-week project. It's been two years. What does this tell you, people? What does this tell you? It tells you two things. First off, the rate of new languages is slowly exceeding the rate of new JavaScript front-end DOM-manipulating libraries specifically. Number two, what this tells you is that engineers are the worst estimators ever. Look at this person. Okay, she, Demi, Demi, Demi or Demi, Demi well, I'll call her Demi for here, from here on out. Demi is a postdoc. Okay, postdoc. That means she went through school, then decided to go back to school, and then decided to go back to school again. And then after being in school, Decided to go back again for languages. <laughs> and then thought, oh, I could probably do this in three weeks. Two years later. <laughs> Honestly, this is literally every one of my projects. This is this is me. This is actually me. Uh, let's see. Nothing else does quite what Ricardan wanted. She started with Swift because she already knew it. If there's ever been a sentence that never needed to be written, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> started with Swift. Why, you ask? Because I knew it. You know, I didn't start with the language I didn't know to design a language. I started with the language I did know and did a lot of research on. I know it's kind of crazy. And Swift supports immutable value semantics. It checked a lot of other boxes she wanted as well, such as compiling to machine code, making it good for systems programming, but also undermines the value semantics because it mixes it with other things she added. That made Rekordan uh, wonder what would happen if she made a language that was purely about mutable value semantics. Okay, so I'm going to be real here. I'm going to be really real and vulnerable with you guys, so please don't say anything that's rude or hurtful. I don't know what mutable value semantics means, okay? My guess is it literally you just have to define when something is mutable. Is that all that it means? In its strictest form of mutable value semantics, references become second-class citizens. They are only created implicitly at function boundaries and cannot be stored in variables or object fields. Hence, variables can never share mutable state. In other words, MVS allows you to return multiple values from a single expression, while MVS restricts how references can be used in a program. Returns multiple values from a single expression, restricts how... How did multiple... Dude, I swear this is just chat GPT, just a, a hallucinating things. Here's a table that summarizes the key difference between MVS and MVS. What the hell are we even looking at? Can we stop using AI to solve everything? Can we just stop? I don't even know what I'm looking at anymore. Now I'm just super confused. Can we just stop using AI to solve literally everything? It is very, very confusing. We're just going to go on, okay? I'm sure what it means is something amazing, but I can't do this anymore, okay? We're going to all pretend like we know what this word means, and we're going to keep on going. It checked a lot of other boxes as well. She wanted, she wanted such as, okay, we already read that. Mutable value semantics is a programming discipline that really focuses on notional, value, not notional values. So if I have an array of things, for example, the value of this array is the most important concept that I want to manipulate, she said. That gives me local reasoning. Is this just going to be another Haskell clone? 
amazing white paper but doesn't actually do anything. I don't know what the hell just I again. What the hell did you just say to me? What are you saying to my face? Uh, to really understand why this approach is needed, Recordan said, uh, consider reference semantics, which is another approach used by modern programming languages, especially imperative languages such as C++, JavaScript, Python, and Java. Uh, these languages distinguish between a primitive data types such as integers or strings sometimes. And those uh, types behave like values, she said. Changing the value of an integer doesn't create an observable side effect to some other place in the program. This is definitely a Haskeller. That's not the case for other data types, such as aggregates, arrays, or hash maps, because they have reference semantics. Okay, okay. What happens if you pass an array to a function in Python, and then this function goes on to change the array, maybe adding an element or removing some element from this array? Then this effect can be observed from the outside of the function. Is, are, have we just been reading hundreds of words to, to just to describe the word mute in front of a variable? Is that... Is, is what I'm hearing right now, it, it, it's, is it literally just going, let mute foo equals five? Is that what they're saying by local reasoning? I knew I was a genius. See, this whole time, this whole time, I'm over here pretending to be stupid for you, okay? But the reality is you, you are stupid, okay? Maybe you should kind of, you know, use your brain a little bit more often, okay? Big brain, okay? Big brain. She explained, the caller of the function will have its own array being changed. You cannot reason locally about the values because every time you call the function, some side effect might occur in a seemingly unrelated part of your program. That make, I mean, I do agree with the idea that you should define. I love the idea of defining mutations. Man, I've said this in completely different terms. Uh, I've always preferred the idea of define when things mutate versus do, uh, don't or defining when they should be immutable. So TypeScript does the opposite of this, right? So if we go back uh, here and go to uh, Scratch. Wait, I thought I had it in here. Uh, scratch, is it in here? Really? Do I not have it? I thought I had like a little... Do I not have it in here? Do I... Is it in here? I thought I had something in here. Huh. Here, let's, let's erase this thing. Uh, and you see this all the time uh, with something like TypeScript. Is that you'll have something like uh, function foo. And foo will take in, uh, say, an array... And it's an it's a number this as const, right? Or no, 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 not as const. And it, in a function header, you go read only. Is read only over here? No, no, that's that's it's right here. There you go. Like you have to specify the inversion of that. You say when it's not changeable versus the other way, which is you have to specify when it's changeable. I think I prefer. I, I prefer the other way, and it's true, uh, because I can go like this. Let's just pretend like this thing is an array of... Can, can we do that? Can we go uh, foo equals, I don't know, uh, foo number. There we go. Lots of foos in this thing, because, you know, I prefer things to be as confusing as possible. You know what I mean? There we go. All right, so this is an array of foo, and so can I go like this? Foo equals five. I hate I hate TypeScript sometimes. I know people love TypeScript. Okay, I get it. Um, I get it. Uh, I get it. I understand that read only means that it's only read only at the array level. But this this ain't it. Okay, this is not how it, it does. It. Stop making excuses for just really annoying behavior. Okay, it's, please, just just drop the copium. Yeah, of course you choose TS over JS. Oh, I 
just it's always emotionally painful when I see those things. That makes it difficult to apply local reasoning for humans, which makes it harder to be sure that programs are correct, she said. But it also makes it uh, difficult for compilers because optimizers need, uh, now need to be very conservative about what happens, she said. The optimizer has to account for the fact that other references might exist and some seemingly unrelated part of the program might need the value that is being mutated. So it's best not to do anything rather than compromise the reference architecture. The value of mutable s value semantics. This is where the value of mutable value semantics becomes useful. Mutable value semantics remove the references from the picture, she explained. Uh, but it preserves in-place mutation, which is very efficient. Absolutely. For instance, if you want to sort an array in place, you don't have to build a bunch of new data structures and try to recombine them, she said. Uh, that kind of peer functional model will put a lot of pressure on your optimizer to recover the lost efficiency. You want to do things in place because allocating a lot of pieces of memory and recombining them uh, together will be very, very slow. I mean, I agree. I, I, every, this is in terms of in terms of computer speed, she's 100 percent correct. Uh, that provides a very transparent per, uh, performance model, which is a very good. So I honestly have no idea what this language does yet. Mutable value semantics removes these references from the picture. You only have values and a bunch of techniques that you could use to per, uh, preserve sufficient expressiveness. It looks like functional programming, but what you really want to preserve is in-place mutation because in-place mutation is very efficient. That's what she said. Um, take care. This is definitely Haskell 2.0. Really, what I'm reading out of this is that the heap was a mistake. <laughs> is that what I'm hearing? The heap was a mistake. We should have just always used the stack to begin with. Um, that's, you know, there's there, there's this funny notion that programming got hard because of the because of the heap. The heap truly ruined programming. Garbage collection is a result of the heap being impossible. If you don't understand the difference between a heap and a stack, like, go, go read about it. Like, I'm sorry, but that, I think that might be slight, slightly out of scope for this talk. Uh, why don't you just create micro, Michael Scott++ plus plus language? Why don't you, shut up! Okay, I'd rather be Bill Burr. Uh, this includes, such, let's see, okay. Uh, the language is designed for systems programming, so it's primarily for any application that runs close to the metal and needs to squeeze the most possible performance from the machine, Ricard then said. That includes uh, uses such as operating systems, memory-intensive applications such as video games or image processing or other applications that can't afford a virtual machine or a garbage collector. Embedded applications would also be a very interesting target, she said. So, again, one of my big problems I have with this whole thing is... Never answered the never answered the original question up here. Why another programming language? You know, like why yet another one? Why doesn't Rust do this enough for you? Rust plus plus, but even harder with rules about. <laughs> yes, even harder. It's even harder with Rust plus plus. This is always my problem with these things. Is like even no matter how much backing and no much. Uh, uh, you know, even if Google, that, I mean, it's the same reason why I have such a hard time with Carbon when Zig already existed, right? Zig, great, great header support. It has a lot of great stuff already really built in. And I know Carbon's like trying to, it's more for C++ and all that, but it's like you get everything you need from Zig and it integrates really, really straightforward. So why yet another version? I just don't get it. I honestly don't get it. I, I don't get the purpose of, of, of more and more. Like, Odin made sense because Odin is a language designed for game programming. It optimizes things that are hard in one language to be easy in this language, right? It's a language designed for a purpose. And to me, that makes, like, that actually makes sense. Designing a language for a purpose makes perfect sense to me. That's why JavaScript is great for the front end. It just is what it is. It's really fault tolerant. It, it it really allows you just to be kind of loosey goosey because you know stuff just changes constantly and it's okay with moving targets and you know it just is what it is and to me that makes sense. You know what I mean? Uh, but Zig doesn't have a direct compatibility with C plus plus. Oh, it doesn't. Okay, okay, it only has direct compatibility with C. Hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, but think about the LinkedIn post. Yeah, Val's uh, purpose is distributed, heterogeneous, highly parallel compute with ease. Is it? Fast by definition, Val is compiled ahead of time uh, to machine code that relies. Uh, we just we just call that compiled uh, on a type system to support in place mutations and avoid unnecessary me memory allocation. Val avoids hidden costs such as implicit copies and therefore avoids heavy dependence on optimizer for basic performance. Side by default or safe by default, Val's foundation of mutable value semantics ensures that ordinary code is memory safe, type safe, and data race free by explicit. Audible opt-in programmers can use unsafe constructs for performance where necessary and can build safe con uh, constructs using unsafe ones. Okay, so they're taking a different approach apparently than, um, than Rust in this case. Okay, Val uh, uh, borrows heavily from Swift, which has demonstrated a user-friendly approach to generic programming and deep support for value semantics. Val's programming model strengthens and extends this support while de-emphasizing reference semantics and avoiding complexity that results in from trying to make it statically safe, uh, e.g. memory regions, lifetime annotations, etc. Okay. Interesting. Sounds great, but why another language? Let's see. Okay, here we go. What sets Val apart in the current landscape is its focus on mutable value. Okay, so they really love this term, mutable value semantics, for uh, for the purpose of writing uh, efficient generic code. Val has zero cost abstraction language that fully acknowledges the physical constraints of computer architecture, yet presents a user model that marries these constraints with the benefits of value-oriented programming. Well, the name is the primogen. <laughs> the name is, I feel slightly embarrassed that I really, truly didn't understand anything I, that, that was just said here. 